going to help a lot. Um, the technology of it is beyond my comprehension. It's a PowerPoint presentation. I, I know how to put one together and how to read it. For some reason, as we come to a certain point in this presentation, some of the slides won't appear. But we'll just imagine. Because uh, the person that we're imagining, this um, Dr. P. Solomon Raj, I'll move this over here, since the men are out of the way, I brought these three along in addition to the PowerPoint screens. Not much out of the way. Yeah, you're right. To let you see what it might look, some of his works, those three, uh, might look like um, as real presentations and to ask yourself the question as we go along, what are those about? Because Raj was a teacher. He died two years ago. He was a teacher and uh, his art was an attempt to engage people in India with the question, what is this all about and what does this say to me? So uh, I remember when I was a pastor many years ago of a parish in St. Charles, Illinois, we were just talking about it because Pastor Carl grew up in Batavia. Those are Fox Valley towns right next to one another. Uh, and um, we built a new church and we had new pyramids uh, and this antipendi which hung over the altar which was being made by this man and it was very expensive. It was made out of raw silk and very beautiful. And I said to him regarding the Easter antipendium, so what does that symbol mean? And he said, if I tell you, that's all you'll ever know. <laughs> <laughs> so he never told me. <laughs> and Raj had that same kind of approach as an artist, that he wanted people to ask questions about his art mm -hmm. and try to come up with some decisions themselves about what this was saying to them, yeah. not just lecturing to them about what it was supposed to mean. So that's the mind of a teacher, and mm -hmm. that's a good a good thought. So these three, you can look at them or you can get up after a while and look more closely at them and decide what you think they're saying to you in true um, Raj fashion. Um, this started here at St. Matthew's because uh, I did an article in December uh, that was supposed to be the Christmas issue of Living Lutheran. Some of you may get that uh, at home. And this article was about uh, P. Solomon Raj. So um, oh. that's uh, oh, sure. a Christmas uh, picture, uh, which may appear on the screen <laughs> in a little while. Uh, but that's what started this. And uh, uh, Sue Swing suggested I do this then as a, a presentation on Sunday morning. Um, my experience with this man goes back uh, a number of years and I uh, this is uh, Raj before he died 2019 December he was 98 uh, and he still worked uh, but increasingly less in art because his chosen media were batiks which these three are mm -hmm. and um, woodblock printing and my own feeling, as you think about art, is that those are two of the most difficult, most complicated areas in which to produce some visual medium. Uh, if you take a brush and you work with uh, watercolor or acrylic or oil and on a canvas, you know, it takes skill, obviously, but you're working with just those tools. If you're working with a woodblock print, for every color that you do, you have to carve a block and you carve it backwards. And then you dip each of those blocks in the different colors and print them on top of one another. Very time consuming. In the batik, you have to determine how many colors you're going to use in this batik. And then you draw on the cloth some uh, image that you're going to create. Uh, so for example, this one here. And then you um, uh, outline the area that you want to produce some color with wax so as to block it, you dip it in the dye uh, vat so that uh, it uh, absorbs that color, then you take it out and then you, uh, and you start with the, uh, the lightest colors and you move to the darkest colors. 
Uh, and it's a very complicated process. And by the time he was 98, he could no longer dip these things in the vats. In fact, he quit that at 92. <laughs> and, and he went to writing poetry. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about his biography in a moment. But uh, he was a Lutheran pastor. And as he uh, got older and asked himself, what can I still do as an artist, he decided to take the poetry of <clears throat> uh, Johann Gerhardt, who was a, um, a Lutheran pastor in, in uh, Berlin and who wrote uh, hymnody, poetry, uh, for hymns. He was going to translate all of that into his native tongue, Telugu. Mm -hmm. So that was something he could do in his 90s. Um, so he continued that as a, what I call a polymath. And this was him being remembered at the age of uh, 100. He had died two years before that. But there was a big celebration in India to remember this. Um, my story with that begins with um, an ecumenical, the German word is Kirchentag, it means church day. And uh, there have been Kirchentags in Germany every couple of years for long over 50 years. And they were the Lutheran churches of Germany coming together uh, to celebrate their unity and to have all kinds of uh, um, festivals involving music and art. So I went because that was the first time in 2003 when the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans came together mm -hmm. to celebrate a Kirchentag, first time ever. Mm -hmm. And this time um, they had a giant uh, hall there at the fairgrounds uh, given to art. And as I walked around, all the different artists, liturgical artists, Christian art, it was basically that kind of thing, um, I was struck by the art of Solomon Raj. And so I talked to the man who was representing him, and he said, I'll give you his card. So he gave me his card, and I started emailing uh, this man in India. We never met uh, until later. And uh, long story short, I started representing him in different uh, places in the United States, different countries. And uh, that was a, a wonderful experience for me. But that's how it all started. And then some years later, my wife and I went to where he lived in central India. The, the state that he lived in was called Andhra Pradesh. And the city within that state he lived in was called Vijayawada. So there he lived with his wife and his children. And they were already grown by that time. And he had formed an ashram, a word you probably know. But an ashram is something in India where a guru uh, brings people together to study art of various kinds. So in his case, it was um, visual art, drama, that was big uh, among Indian people, dance, music. He did all of those things with children and with adults. They would come together in his school, as it were. And uh, as you walked through that place, you could see sculptures that he tried to work with and wood carvings and other things. As he tried to figure out, what am I going to do? Because here was this man. Uh, who had become a Lutheran pastor, and his passion was how to share the gospel with people in India. And as he struggled to ask himself how he would do that, he decided on these two media that I talked about, batiks and, and uh, woodblock printing. And um, um, those things uh, you could see predominating in his uh, ashram. Long story short, I suggested to him perhaps I could represent him in uh, various places. Uh, the foreign country ones, I never went there myself. I just did it all by people that I had contact with, whether in Palestine, in Bethlehem. Uh, we did an exhibition uh, in London, in Canada, um, and in different places in the United States. Many of them uh, sold his artwork and then with the money, send it to him because it was his means of income. If there was anything he was not, he was not a businessman. He had no sense of how in the world he was going to make money from his art, even though he gradually had become famous as a scholar um, and an artist in his part of the world. Uh, so make a long story short, his, his um, 
artwork, about 300 pieces of it, was all donated to the Brouwer Museum at Valparaiso University. Um, the sad story there was, come COVID, it was supposed to have been an exhibition two years ago at the Brouwer Museum. Come COVID, the Brouwer Museum closed, the director was let go, it has not been reopened. There were serious financial problems at Valpo and also um, at the Brouwer Museum. And so we're waiting for it to be reopened to them to get a new curator, a new director, who can uh, take care of this exhibition and, and put it back on. The hope is that it might take place in 2023. Um, just a couple definitions. I don't particularly care for the word Christian art because it begs the question as to um, in what way is it Christian? Uh, was it done by an artist who's Christian? Um, there are some people who are non-Christian who paint biblical paintings. So is that Christian art? Does the, does the artist have to be Christian? Does the art have to represent something specifically Christian? So I like the term art with Christian themes. And I'm gonna use five examples uh, of the resurrection uh, to give you some understanding of how we deal with that theme, how art has dealt with that theme down to the centuries. And then the last one will be one of Raj's um, paintings of the resurrection. Um, this is a Renaissance painting of Piero della Francesco, 1465. It's Italian. Um, it, I use it as a typical example of Western art of the resurrection, moving beyond naturalism, which is just um, an attempt to reproduce, uh, reproduce what maybe the resurrection scene would have looked like. This artist goes beyond that because he's saying, he's making a statement. So what do you think he's trying to say to the viewer? Uh, let, me, let me tell you a couple things. You might not know what it is. He's standing on a Roman sarcophagus. Yeah. That's what that is. Uh, the soldiers are asleep. Um, what's, in some senses, unnatural about this? What goes beyond naturalism? The leaning tower. The leaning tower? There isn't. OK, at some distance, it may be not so clear as to what you actually see there. But you see the Christ figure standing over the sarcophagus. Now, he's obviously risen out of the tomb, but he's risen rather grandly, gloriously, victoriously, holding the victory flag. So he's making a statement, the artist is. He looks to me, if you look closely, like he spends a lot of time at the gym. <laughs> he's got great apps. <laughs> and um, he's saying, I have conquered. Um, and the cross in the, in the symbol, of course, many years earlier, Constantine used that as a symbol. In this sign, you will conquer um, the, um, the sign of the cross. And so oh, Christ has conquered. And, and uh, we as Christians, our theology typically says that sign, that conquering, belongs not so much at the crucifixion, but at the resurrection. That's where the conquering really took place. Now, another one. Stained glass, American. Anybody recognize it? I took this on Ash Wednesday. Went up to the chancel and I said, look at that. Um, here is the Roman sarcophagus. Here is the burial clause and the crown of thorns thrown aside. Here is the soldiers asleep. Here is the victorious Jesus rising out of the tomb. Mm -hmm. So your artist, I don't know who he was or she was, uh, did a great job of representing that Western theme yeah. of the resurrection in art. Yeah. Now, if uh, when you go back next Sunday, see if you can remember this, <laughs> where is the flag of victory? You do see on his head uh, a cross, mm -hmm. but the victory flag is in the central window 
way at the top above the lamb. The lamb mm -hmm. above the cross mm -hmm. is holding the, the victory flag. Mm -hmm. It's not above the resurrection. Well, that's a kind of a theological statement. Um, I think it belongs here, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what do we in our various countries, our various ethnic backgrounds do with biblical stories as we move from one part of um, the world to another? Uh, I used to collect nativity sets because they were fascinating to me in the sense that um, a, a carver in Africa would represent the figures in the nativity with Negroid fe features, mm -hmm. and I thought that was really interesting and probably appropriate yeah. for them. Uh, here you see uh, an interesting one. The angel is a black man mm -hmm. sitting at the tomb speaking to the three women who come to anoint the body of Jesus. He is not here, he is risen. The man is saying, interestingly, this is a German picture, <laughs> not an American one. And they prepared it for um, Sunday school children in Africa in their mission state, uh, stations. Um, I wish I had made that bigger, but for some reason I couldn't somehow uh, get it to be bigger. This is a Chinese-American artist. He's, he was born in China. His name is He Chi. Um, he's very popular in the United States. See if you can decide. Uh, it's a resurrection scene. It's small, but um, see if you can decide why that's so popular in the United States right now, apart from the fact He Chi relocated, lives in the United States as an American marketer who's advertising his art. That's one reason. What else do uh, you think appeals to Americans more than Chinese? The color. The yeah. colors are bright. very bright. And the faces. And the faces. If you could see the, the faces and the eyes, they are oriental eyes. They are kind of elongated. Um, <laughs> And so it's Chinese in that sense, very oriental. Uh, I think of Picasso's uh, Guernica, where everything went crazy as he was trying to portray the bombing of that city by the Nazis. Everything's going crazy in this picture as uh, somebody with a, like a devil's mask over here mm -hmm. is wild because death has been destroyed and this woman is sideways and everything's kind of cockeyed but the victorious Christ is rising up in the middle and symbolizing um, the new world, the new life. But I think the most powerful thing for Americans who have been through Disney uh, is the color. It's not just technicolor, it's polychrome. It's, it's um, what's another word for um, the rosy cheek Jesus. It, it's... Um, Iridescent, okay, it's not something that probably is true. There's a lily there too, isn't it? Thank you, thank you. The, the lily is the symbol of the resurrection. And now we go to our Samuel, Solomon Raj. Um, there are some things in this which are similar to what you see in the world. Christ is victorious. He's rising out of the tomb, but what's he rising above? Yeah. Death, yeah. exactly. A dead man, any dead man. Death is conquered. Yeah. What's in the middle there? Those. Are those lotus? They are lotus blossoms. For Indians, the symbol of life that comes out of death. Because a lotus bulb, which is in water, looks like anything dead but in water, in a swamp, it'll grow up and produce this beautiful symbol of life, lily, mm -hmm. the, the lotus blossom. And that is very powerful in, in Raj's pictures. Uh, the sun for him is always a symbol of God's presence. Um, and, and Jesus is wearing something that every Indian will know. Uh, you may not know the word, but this garment, what we sometimes call a loincloth, yeah. in Indian, in, in um, Hindi, is called a dhoti. 
D-H-O-T-I, worn by the nobodies of India, the Dalits. Mm -hmm. So let's reflect a little bit on that background to see how Raj tends to challenge the thinking of people as you move from the ordinary in life to, um, to discover a sense of joy that permeates his art. Uh, the woman on the left uh, is, is dancing for joy. Uh, she is clothed in red, um, which in the Indian world is a symbol of something uh, divine and something pure. Uh, this is Ruth, uh, who has just discovered from Boaz that she is chosen and she will not have to spend her life alone. So the, the picture is powerful for several reasons. It's a woman in Indian art and in lots of uh, art around the world. You don't find women ha having that prominent a role as you do in uh, Raj's art. It's one of the things that he wants to do in lifting up the marginalized, showing the joy of a woman who has discovered she has been embraced by Boaz, by God. The other woman is a fascinating picture to me. Uh, that's um, this is um, Abraham's mistress who bore Ishmael, Hagar. Why is that story important? Because Hagar is regarded in Islam, in the Arab world, as the mother of the Arab peoples. So I have a young friend who's a Muslim, and um, I wanted to give a, a reproduction of that to him as a gift. He said, I can't accept it. And I said, why? He said, I'm not allowed to accept any representation of holy figures. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so I had to keep it. And I felt badly about that, but I understand where he's coming from. Also, Judaism had that same kind of um, fear about representing divine figures because of the commandment um, that you shall not have, make any graven images. That's mm -hmm. where it comes from. And so here is Hagar and Ishmael with the angel bringing a future, bringing a possibility of life, bringing joy, and the, and the Quran would say, um, bringing a new nation. A couple of things, um, let me just quickly suggest those, even though that may be difficult to see uh, from a distance. Um, <coughs> In India today, still, there are these caste categories which divide people according to their heritage. And if you're born into it, you know it. Um, surprising that that can be known uh, so far back. But nevertheless, a Brahmin is the priestly caste. Um, the uh, uh, Kriya. Uh, are the uh, warriors, uh, the nobility, uh, they know who they are. Um, the Vaisha are farmers and artisans and tradespeople. The Shudra are tenants and servants. Those are castes, known castes. They know who they are. But Dalits are not caste. They're nobodies. Mm -hmm. They're untouchables. Uh, <coughs> Raj is a Dalit, was a Dalit. That was his heritage. And the statistics are interesting because 16% um, of Indian people are Dalits, untouchable, no caste. 90% uh, of Pakistani, we'll talk about the division between India and Pakistan in a moment, but 90% uh, of Pakistani Christians are Dalits. 94% of Indian Christians are Dalits. So what does that tell you? The majority of the Christians in Pakistan and in India are untouchables. Why? What, what sense would that make? Well, the Hindu faith is not working for them. The Hindu faith is saying, you're nothing. Yeah. 
you're nothing. You're untouchable. You 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 can't even be a servant. Uh, so um, the Christians reached out to the Dalits when they came as missionaries because they were open to the discussion of in Christ you become someone. Mm -hmm. You become um, not untouchable, but touchable. Um, now, there are 27 million Indians who are Christian. That sounds like an enormous amount. The ELCA, for example, what is it, 5 million, 5.5 million? I mean, there are 27 million in India who are Christian, but uh, that's only 2.5% 2, 2 of the population. <laughs> India is vast. So it's a very small amount uh, of the country. And the dilemma of these people is that they face poverty, they face discrimination, it's a hopeless situation. And Raj the Dalit said, how can I, who have been lucky enough to become a Lutheran pastor, uh, how can I uh, reach out to these people? <coughs> with, with preaching? Okay. He acquired a PhD in communication. He was asking himself how he could reach out and he finally decided he would do it through a medium of art. An example um, from the Bible of Jesus doing the same thing, speaking to a woman at the well, well mm -hmm. the Syrophoenician woman, the woman who had had a bunch of husbands, the woman who was treated by her uh, fellow uh, Samaritans as um, a nobody, and uh, if Jesus talked to nobodies, why shouldn't I, said Solomon Raj, and create a new, a new message for them. Now, here's where we run into some problems with my PowerPoint. And so I'm not quite sure what we're going to end up with. <laughs> but uh, let me take what I've got. Uh, let me say a few things about him um, biographically. He was born in a little hick village. I think 300 people live there. Negapudi, state of Andhra Pradesh, South India. Born in 1921, he married a woman who we had the privilege of meeting, both uh, he and his wife. Um, six children, all of which are alive today, 10 grandchildren, 10 great-grandchildren. He became a school teacher. Uh, then a pastor. He earned an MA at the University of Indiana in Bloomington in communication. Um, he worked in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia as a radio producer. Um, if you look at some of his art, you will see, uh, if you know anything about uh, Ethiopia, uh, half of the people, at least a little bit more than half, are Christian, uh, what we would say Coptic Christian or Ethio Ethiopian Orthodox, they prefer. To say and and they are always shown in icons with big eyes and those big eyes in some senses are characteristic of Ethiopian people themselves and they tend to have very glorious eyes but the Raj puts those eyes because he spent time there on many of his paintings of people uh, he earned a PhD in Birmingham uh, he served as an artist in residence at Bethany uh, Lutheran College at Lenore Rhine and at Luther in Decorah. Uh, mm -hmm. So for two years, he worked in the ELCA colleges. Um, then he studied art in all kinds of places. He studied the art of Albrecht Dürer, who did woodcuts, among other things, mm -hmm. uh, in Germany. Um, he studied uh, uh, woodblock printing in Japan. He studied um, um, various kinds of batik making in the Philippines and in Indonesia. Um, and then he decided to develop a, an ashram. And so from 1994 to 2000, he ran this ashram where he brought people together, exploring many different ways to learn about um, something that their Indian culture made very real to them, art. But as a Christian, he wanted them to see what art could say about Jesus. And so he came up with creative approaches to doing that. 
So now we're going to see what we've got here. Who are these women? <laughs> <laughs> I wish you saw that. <laughs> um, so they are, um, they are the four, they are the, uh, the five women uh, of the, um, the wedding feast, the bridesmaids. And they are decorated in beautiful red uh, saris. And they are chosen uh, as the women who are going to be able to come into the wedding feast because they were properly dressed for the occasion and the rest don't get in. And what's the question that one might ask when one sees this picture if you're a Hindu? Um, because Raj is speaking primarily to Hindus. The great majority of people in India are Hindu. Um, I don't know if we'll come to this slide, so I'll see it now. Um, the division took place in 1947 when there was this terrible break uh, in India between um, what was essentially a religious war between the, the Muslims and the, the Hindus. And the Muslims were all driven east into what is Pakistan, and the Hindus remained in India. Hope we can get to the picture which shows that break. But in any case, um, the Hindus are the people that Raj is trying to speak to and say, uh, okay, what's this picture all about? Who are these people in red? Somebody's going to have to talk to them and say, all right, these women uh, were chosen. And how, how do you become chosen? How do you become one of the chosen? And then you can share the gospel. One of the things that Raj did uh, for his people is that vast numbers of people, especially the Dalits, are illiterate. They cannot read. So uh, he realized that in the Middle Ages there had been monks who went around with pictures of biblical stories and, and those pictures would be shared with people and then they could learn the good news by looking at those pictures. So he developed a Hindu uh, Bible in which there would be three pictures, a triptych, and this particular one, which is magically gone, um, <laughs> is a picture of God the Father sending out the Son. That's the first picture, saying, go my Son and fulfill my objective for you on earth. Second picture is Jesus on the cross, and surrounding him are all the people who are being pulled out of terrible situations, the disenfranchised and the imprisoned and all the passages that we read about in Matthew about how these people are being freed from their bondage through Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. And then in the last picture of the triptych, you see uh, the Father welcoming Jesus back, saying, well done, good and faithful servant. So that's um, a picture story, almost like a Sunday school book, for people who can't read. Aha! <laughs> it appears. So the picture that was in Living Lutheran is this wonderful um, nativity. Uh, I love it because of the lively colors. Um, <coughs> Mary is placed in an aureole. This is a very ancient uh, kind of symbol in which you know, you know what a halo is, where you, you place a, a circle around a person's head to symbolize that that's a divine person, that's a holy person. Uh, but when you encase the entire body, uh, it's called an aureole, and um, so Mary is placed in that aureole. Joseph is an insignificant figure. To <laughs> he is a true Dalit. <laughs> He's a nobody. You see that? Who's coming up on the left? And who's coming up on the right? Shepherds. Those are shepherds. Now, if you could see closely what I love about this, the eyes, yeah. and the eyes, yeah. the only place his eyes really show on those two, maybe somewhat of Joseph as well. So on the icons of the Orthodox Church, when you want to show someone who is already uplifted spiritually into the other world by virtue of their contemplation of the divine, the eyes go up into their head. <laughs> and so here in Mary, in this holy scene, where she wearing the robes of divinity in the Hindu culture, red, not white, um, 
is symbolized as one who is entering into the bliss uh, which belongs to the divine. That's the picture that was in Living Luther. Who knows what the green has to do with that's something odd, but this is a, this is an interesting picture of Jesus carrying the cross. Um, the question that the Hindu can ask is, okay, why is he carrying a cross? What's he got a crown of thorns on his head for? And secondly, he's got a dhoti on him. Oh. Mm -hmm. So he looks like a Hindu, but Hindus don't carry crosses and they don't wear crowns of thorns. So who is that guy and what's going on here? It's the question that the teacher wants to put before um, the audience. Ah, this one did show up. I love this. Because at certain points, um, the preacher, um, the theologian, the pastor asks, uh, how political can I get in my proclamation? And uh, within our Lutheran community, we tend to uh, be somewhat skeptical about taking stands which are too political because we realize we can divide our audience by doing that because there'll be people with different perspectives um, listening. And so um, in, in, in the United States today, um, take, take COVID as, as an example. You had people on one end of the spectrum who were shouting and screaming uh, from the pulpit about the inappropriateness of wearing masks and how it was not trusting God and blah, blah, blah. And you had people on the other end who were saying this is something that we're doing to protect one another and to save one another. So political issues like that are always problematic. Uh, Raj, the Lutheran pastor, minority group in India, decides to address in his art the division that's taking place in 1927. Terrible, terrible things took place. If you think what you see on TV with Ukraine is bad, this was horrible in that um, as the trains moved from one side uh, to take all of the Muslims out of India and move them into a new section that was to be Pakistan, the Hindus would kill all the people on the train so nothing but a slaughtered train would arrive. Oh. And when they tried to escape as Hindus from Pakistan and get back into the homeland of India, the, the uh, Muslims killed them all too. So it was just horrible what was going on. And so um, Raj decides to make a religious and a political statement. There's a fence going right down the middle. There is a Indian soldier who's standing there guarding, so nobody from Pakistan goes back into India. The Pakistanis are standing as Muslims, with Muslim guard, but behind them, you can't see it very well, is a man with a crown of thorns mm -hmm. on his head. And the question Raj wants to put to the viewer is, who is that guy, what's he doing there? And why is he on the Pakistani side? So a very powerful um, theological, political statement, uh, which he in, was still a young man um, capable of making. Was this done in 47? It was done in 1947. Yes. The painting. The painting, right. And that, that was a, um, a woodblock. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I should have said as we went through, these are batiks but there were wood blocks which appeared on there. There's a picture of nobody. <laughs> the Dalit, the Dalit nobody. <clears throat> ah, well, for some reason, um, what, what ended up at the end did not appear. Um, so, uh, to, to bring all of that to a, a kind of a climax, um, the, um, the artist and, and the theologian um, attempts within his own country to speak to people who 
uh, he hopes will hear the good news, if not for the first time, at least in a powerful way. Um, is he known in this country? Um, ever so gradually, he's coming to be known, let's say, through the Living Lutheran article. But among people in the United States, if you would say, which Asian Christian artist or artist who works with Christian themes is known, he would not be mentioned. Hey, Chi, the, the Chinese American who now lives here, is popularly known in many circles. But Solomon Raj, not so much, simply because he doesn't have a marketer, uh, because the only marketer who he did have, uh, me, at different kinds of um, uh, exhibitions, was not a marketer at all, really. I was, <laughs> I was a friend of the artist who was representing him in different kinds of exhibitions. Um, but um, the, um, the different places in which he's known um, appreciate what he's done. Uh, let's just take a look at these uh, paintings over here. This is the biggest one, so you can probably uh, see it a little bit better. Um, there are a couple of, of Raj's works which are um, secular. Very few. This is not secular. So um, that's a clue. <laughs> Any thoughts as to what is happening there or what that's all about? Coming from Texas, I recognized these cacti, which grow all over the place in Texas. So is it the parable of the seeds? Of the peas? Of the seeds. Seeds, aha. Uh -huh. Close. Close parable of the seed and the sower. Close. Think of another parable. Um, clue, these are cacti, but they're meant to be weeds. Mm -hmm. okay. And in Texas, frankly, they sort of grow all over the place in the countryside. They're like weeds. But they must also grow in India. These are supposed to be wheat. No. Mm -hmm. The kernels are rather bigger than life size, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're meant to symbolize the parable of the wheat and the tares. Mm -hmm. um, or, that's I guess King James English, on the, the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Um, and so it begs a question. So what is this about? And the Hindu wouldn't have a clue. But somebody who can use that uh, as, a, as a talking piece would uh, talk about the great judgment day that lies before us. Uh, and that it's not our responsibility to try to separate the wheat from the tares here and now and say, you're out and you're in, but uh, to let God do that uh, in the great judgment. And in between, we have the opportunity to hear the good news. Um, this one is very colorful. You see something that, that you recognize in there now, having seen a couple of other... Lotus. Lotus, okay. Which apparently is everywhere in India. I, I couldn't <coughs> tell you what time of the year the lotus typically grows uh, in ponds and, and uh, water. Uh, if you come up close, you'll see there's some frogs and some other little creatures in the water. Um, the sun is for Raj, a symbol of God. Um, it is a symbol of, of coming out of the depth, the darkness, death, life. Might be going too far to say it's a resurrection picture, except to say that it is a symbol of new life coming out of death, and God alone can make that happen. Would a Hindu see reincarnation there? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, if I were standing next to the picture at the exhibition and saying to the Hindu, no, we don't believe in reincarnation. So Raj wasn't thinking of that. But, you know, it's a good question to, to reflect on future, uh, ongoing life coming back again and again and again. 
Um, I'm not really sure how to address that other than it's a good question. This one you have to actually walk up to and see it, but it, it's an interesting story because um, these strips are, um, I'm, I'm wrong, these are not batiks, these are batiks. This is a woodblock print. Oh, I'm, I'm glad that that's there. So there was a long strip like this with a picture of women. So he had to carve, so there's one, two, three, at least f four colors in there. He had to carve four blocks upside down mm -hmm. uh, or backwards uh, to make that strip. And um, they're all women that are kind of like in some sort of a procession. This looks like a procession of men. And this one in the middle, if you look close, because in the middle here is Jesus on Palm Sunday. This is the Palm Sunday procession. So I said to him by email, we did an enormous email correspondence at one point, what's going on in those pictures? He said, you know, they were just test strips. I was just kind of seeing what I could do. <laughs> <laughs> this one is clearly Palm Sunday. But he said, I just, so I put them together and framed them and called it Pilgrims All. Aww. And that's basically what we are. We are all pilgrims who are marching to a destination, a destination in God. And um, I thought it was something that the artist really didn't think about when he put that together because there are probably in the Brower Museum now, or the collection, maybe 15 of these strips oh. with different things mm -hmm. on them. So it wasn't ever meant as a something to be put together. Mm. I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes. I'm a greeter today, but I wanted to pass on to you my experience with the caste system. Ah. A college professor of mine, and we're having coffee break. He, he, he married out of his, his system. Up or down, I'm not sure which way. Nobody would talk to him. The family just gave up on him and what have you. They finally, the two of them finally came to the United States. That's how the definitive that is. That's terrible. There are new laws which are attempting to um, suppress the caste system, yes. but it's still fairly strong and people typically don't marry outside their caste. Right. And that means you've got to know something about your genetic, uh, genealogical background. Um, and I'm surprised that, you know, among people who don't have a lot of computers and genealogists to work with, that they know all that stuff. But I better get to work. Thank you. So <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions, reflections on Pulidindi is his family name. It comes first. So in some languages like Hungarian, uh, the, the surname comes first. So I have a friend whose name is Cipregi, that's his family name, Andras, that's his first name. So he's Cipregi Andras. Uh, and so this is Puladindi Solomon. Is there a website where many of his... If you would Google um, Solomon Raj or Puladindi Solomon Raj, you'll find uh, websites which are dealing with his art. And if you, if you, after you've Googled his name, push image or images, whatever it says on your computer, you'll see all kinds of images oh. of his art on oh. your computer. Mm -hmm. and, and don't churches use his artwork as bulletin company? Yeah, there's a company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but they secured the right to reproduce uh, Raj's art and sell it to churches who want to use it for their bulletins and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just can't remember it at the moment, but I can find it if anybody wanted to know. It wouldn't be icons, would it? E oh, oh, thank you. E-Y-E -E icons. -E exactly. I have purchased from them many times. Oh, really? Yes. OK, so yes. I will look for that. Yeah, so icons, E-Y-E-C-O-N-S, -E icons, is the name of it, ink, dot ink. <clears throat> That's the name of the website. And I've had a lot of discussion with the guy who owns that, uh, and he has a lot of different kinds of artists on that website. Thank you for coming. Welcome back next week. <laughs>